In this episode, I share my ADHD story and how I masked when I was younger and how that eventually fell apart and I needed to find something different. I'm sharing this story as a way to normalize our neurodivergent ADHD experiences and help us really connect with each other and understand that we're not alone and that this happens to most of us or many of us. So if this is you, be sure to listen. Hi, I'm Jen Barnes, and you're about to experience how to ditch the old ways of doing things, embrace your neurodivergence, learn tips and tricks to function optimally, and love yourself, neurodivergence and all. Welcome to the Self-Loved Woman Podcast. Hey, it's Jen. Today, I want to share a little bit about my ADHD story. I didn't know I had ADHD growing up. I just know that I love to move, and dance is probably what saved me. But I always did well in school, and I now know (laughs) that it's because I found that I was able to get accolades for academic achievements and doing well and my intelligence. And so I was able to mask some of my ADHD by getting really good grades and things like that, even though there were still really subtle signs of it, like I didn't do well at testing. Because when I would do the reading comprehension on the Iowa Basic Standards test, I was a slow reader because of my ADHD. I couldn't focus. And a lot of times I had to read the paragraph like it was a play in my head so that I could get myself to focus because it would stimulate enough dopamine that I was like, oh yeah, this is interesting now. But it turns out on those time tests, there's not time for that. So I was often unable to finish. Despite my high math scores and my good grades, I was unable to score much above the 60s in a lot of my reading tests, as well as the tests that involved reading, like social studies and even some of the science stuff on those Iowa basic standard tests. I remember it just left me devastated, feeling like I was an idiot. I'm sure I'm not alone in that. I'm sure that we all have those times where our ADHD interfered with our performance on something and then made us feel stupid. Having gone to Catholic school my entire life, I was pretty terrified of the nuns. And even the lay teachers, like there was a lot of shame and fear used to teach us how to behave. That's what forced me to figure out how to mask the heck out of my symptoms so that I wasn't like getting in trouble because you didn't want to be in trouble in the school I went to. That was like not going to happen. And so I found ways to make myself focus. I found that anxiety helped me get stuff done. We know that now that A lot of times people with D have anxiety, and some of the anxiety is anxiety about being judged and rejected for our ADHD or shamed. But some of us figured out that, oh, if I can get my fight or flight response involved here, like through procrastination or through creating some kind of fear, or maybe in the case of Catholic school, for me, it was real fear, then that anxiety will help me focus enough to get something done. And this worked well enough for me. I did really well academically all through high school, and even in college, until <laughs> until I was an actuary. I became an actuary out of college, which really, I was an actuarial analyst. And what that is, is you do financial analysis and pricing for insurance companies. And I love my job because it was math, and I didn't have to do reading, something that I wasn't good at at the time, or at least was told I wasn't good at, right? And so I got to do a lot of math, and it was awesome. I loved my job. But I had to take these exams every six months, and it involves self-study, which involves reading these really dry textbooks and sometimes multiple books for each exam, often taking more than one exam at a time. The pass rate on these exams at the time was 28%, and that included people taking the exam for the second and third time. And so the stakes were pretty high. These exams were very, very rigorous. And had it been just math, I probably would have been fine. But what I found is that reading those books that were so dry was like torture to me. I just couldn't get myself to focus. It was so understimulating. And there was nothing I could get myself to do to be able to read through it at any kind of pace that would allow me to learn the material in the six months I had. So much so that I found myself with not enough hours in a day to be able to learn everything. But I didn't know why. I didn't know, oh, everyone else can just read this book and it's fine. It's not a problem, right? I just at the time felt like, oh, okay, these people are smarter than me. I've met my match. I'm not able to do this. I can't cut it. I was able to pass four exams. (laughs) Woohoo. 
But when I finally hit the life contingencies exam, which was a bear at the time, I was taking it the third time and still just didn't feel prepared. I just couldn't get myself to study it enough to really master it, to really be able to ace that exam or even just be part of the 28% that passed. And so I started to become really depressed. My anxiety by this time was already out of control because I'd been using anxiety for years to get myself to focus and to get myself through college and all that, which I did well in college. I graduated magna cum laude. Woohoo! Yay! Awesome! Except that the amount of time I spent studying in high school and college was way more than people who had like a similar level of intelligence as me. And I just didn't know it. I just thought I was one of those people who had to work harder to get by. I didn't know I had ADHD. Another early sign was in fifth grade. I remember my mom having driven me back to school from home. I think it was only like two or three times in the same night. She said it was like five to go get something I had forgotten at school. At the end of that, she was like, yeah, I'm not driving you back anymore. I've had it. You've got to find a way to remember your shit. Right. I don't think she swore at me, but that was kind of the message. And so we worked with my fifth grade teacher who taught me how to use an assignment notebook, something that we didn't have back then. We didn't do planners. So my mom took me to Target and we used an assignment notebook and I would write every single thing out that had to be taken home, every assignment. And then I had to have that written before I could leave for the day. And then when I would get home, I had to follow that. You know, I didn't need my mom to check it. I was very self-motivated that way. But I needed to know what to do because some kids just figure that out. For me, my brain couldn't figure that out, but I had no idea why. Now I know, right? But getting back to my actuarial days, I ended up getting really, really depressed. I, I just felt stupid, like, oh, my gosh, these people are just smarter than me. I can't cut it. And so eventually I was like, I can't live like this. There's not enough hours in a day to study as much as I need past these exams, and I'm wasting my 20s on this. I kept thinking if I die in, you know, in my 30s, I will feel like I never lived, right? And so what I ended up doing is stopping my exams and switching careers. So for a while, I did computer programming, and it was so boring. It was so understimulating to me that, like, I would fall asleep at my desk. And so... If you're someone with ADHD, you know we've got to have enough stimulation to have us be focused. So that wasn't a fit. Meanwhile, meeting with my therapist, I decided I wanted to be a therapist myself. And so that journey was a good one for me. But I will say there was a lot of reading with it. And what I learned is if I could do my reading on the elliptical trainer for grad school, right? There's a ton of reading for graduate school and social work. But if I did it while I was moving, I was able to focus. I was increasing stimulation enough to get myself to focus. And then I wouldn't have to read my paragraphs over and over and over and over. Long, long, long story, a little bit shorter. I was able to graduate with my master's in 2005. And I didn't know I had ADHD. I just thought I was someone who had to work harder than everybody else. Until I was working at an agency that worked with children's mental health. And we had a staff day for which... We all had to draw a diagnosis and act it out for the day to help us kind of be able to understand the different diagnoses more and also to help catch diagnoses better. Even though that wasn't our job as case managers, they want us to be informed. You know, looking back, maybe that wasn't the most hmm, kind way of honoring people's mental health and things like that. But it was a way at the time, a long time ago, for us to get a feel for this. Well, I drew ADHD. And so I just was like super hyperactive. And, you know, because back then we thought of ADHD as the hyperactive boy thing, right? So I was super hyperactive and inattentive and distracted and all that kind of stuff. And at the end of the day, everyone had guessed everyone else. And I was the only one who no one had guessed. And they're like, Jen, we don't, we can't figure it out. And I was like, I have been so obviously being this all day, like intensely. I cannot believe you have not caught it yet. And when I told them ADHD, they all looked at each other. They're like, we thought you were just being yourself. And I was like, oh, okay, a bunch of people who work in mental health who really know what ADHD is because we worked with a lot of kids who'd been diagnosed. 
were like, oh, we just thought that was you when I was acting out ADHD. And so that led me to go get to be assessed, right? But here's the thing. I was assessed and they didn't give me the diagnosis. And the reason they didn't, and it says, you know, I went back and read it because I was like, oh, cool. I don't have ADHD. Ha ha. But now that I've gone back years later, because I really do have ADHD, I've gone back years later and looked at it. And what it said was, you probably would meet criteria except between your intelligence and your tools that you have to, to work with it. You don't meet criteria. So basically what it said is I, as a woman, had learned how to mask well enough to be considered functional. Even though the way that I'm functional requires a crap ton of work, right? Like, I have to exercise every day. I have to do yoga and meditate every day. I have to do free writing. I use Julie Cameron's morning pages idea, like just brain dump writing (laughs) in the morning so I can get some of that out. And I have a bunch of other tools I use just to be able to function. But for the level my intelligence happens to be, my functioning is actually lower than it should be. And that's because I have ADHD. This is so common for us women. We women are told as girls that we have to behave and get along and be the quiet, compliant ones. And especially if you're a Gen Xer or older, I know you grew up with that. Some of you millennials may have too, and even Gen Zers, I'm not sure. I'd love to hear your experience. But we grow up with this idea about what it is to be a girl that we have to be compliant and do it right. And if we just get good grades, we'll do good enough in life, right? And then some of us go out and we find that that is just not the case. And we realize that the rules of society are different than the rules of school. And so what we use to mask as a kid no longer works. So then we either figure out new ways to mask that help us function, but really just get by, or we start to fall apart. Or in my case, we start to fall apart and then we change our life entirely so that we can function or just get by, right? And so my life now looks very, very different. I, you know, working for other people never really worked that great for me. I don't like the eight to five schedule. That does not work for me. Having someone like waste my time in meetings telling me what to do when I already know what to do and not giving me the help I actually need, waste of time unsolicited advice, waste of time, (laughs) stuff like that. And with ADHD, I require a lot of self-care, a lot of (laughs) self-love rituals to be able to function. And so spending time in meetings that aren't helping me just sucked the life out of me. And so when I went into private practice, what I found is, first of all, I got to make my own schedule. So I work 10 to 7. And what that allows me to do is have like two and a half, three hours in the morning. Yes, I'm serious. Two and a half to three hours in the morning to be able to get up at my own pace, to do my gratitude journal, my morning pages or brain dump journaling, to make my lemon water, to meditate, to do a little spiritual reading, to get my exercise in and then some yoga. And then I can get ready, you know, shower, whatever, eat, that kind of stuff. But it allows me to get in my self-love morning ritual, which really I need to function. Whereas when I was eight to five, everything is running around and crazy and there's so much wasted time in that day. And so between that and then my choice, I chose not to have kids, which I don't think I could have had kids. Everyone's like, oh, you'd have been such a great mom. You're so nurturing. And I'm like, yeah, when I have my three hours in the morning, I am. But if you see me without eight hours of sleep, if you see me without having my morning ritual, you would disagree. And so for me as an ADHD woman, I live alone in a very small house that's easy to maintain. I have my house set up in ways that I don't want to say accommodate my ADHD, but just support my ADHD, right? I've got a special spot where on top of my dirty laundry, it's like there's a shelf, right? So my bin of clean, unfolded laundry from the week before can just go there if I don't get to folding it. I also, you don't see this, but over here, I've got my laundry that is on the drying racks from Sunday. Today's Thursday is the day I'm recording this. And so there's space up here in my house outside of my main living area downstairs 
where those clothes can hang on the drying rack all day and I can just take clothes off during the week. From there, instead of having to put all of it away if I'm just going to use it the next week. You know, and for a while I was like, oh, for shame. Oh, I can't put away my clothes. And now I'm like, you know what it is? I only have so many spoons. I only have so much energy. And by living alone and having my own space for this that's outside of my main living area so I don't have to look at it all the time, it just it just honors that, like, I'm probably not going to put that shit away. Like, it's just not going to happen. And rather than shaming myself for it, I've just created space for it. Rather than fighting myself and being like, oh, gosh, I've got to find a way to get that laundry off the drying racks. What happens is that I put it there on Sunday after I do laundry, and I have no idea when it's even dry by, so by the time it's probably dry, I've long forgotten that it's there. So, because it's out of sight, right? Out of mind. And so I'm not going to spend time in the middle of my, you know, very full work week putting away the damn laundry. Like, it's just not going to happen for me. And maybe that's something you can do, but I'm sure there's things you can think of, too, where it's like, gosh, I've been shaming myself forever about not being able to do this. Well, what would it be like for you if you were to say, F that, maybe this is just one of those things like Jen's laundry that I'm not going to get to. So how can you make space for that in your life? I mean, there's some stuff we have to do. We have to eat. We have to go to the bathroom. I recommend showering and brushing your teeth and things like that, both because it's good for you, right? And it creates problems if you don't do those things, but also because it can be hard socially and work-wise <laughs> if you happen to work with other people. But there's some stuff that we just don't have to do. So my hope for sharing my story today is to normalize our ADHD experience as women who probably masked much of our life, had no idea we had ADHD, and now we're in our 30s and 40s and we're like, why isn't this working anymore? Especially if you're going through perimenopause. Holy smokes. That'll do a number on your attention already, right? And it just exacerbates all that ADHD stuff. But so much of it can be shaping our lives to match our experience. Instead of trying to put ourselves, our square pegged selves, into this round hole of neurotypical life. So I'd, I'd love for you to comment, or you can DM me on Instagram at Pathways to Wellness MN, like just how you can stop taking your square pegged ADHD, or maybe it's a star pegged ADHD, or something more exciting than a square, right? And stop trying to put it in the square hole of neurotypical life. Like, tell me one thing you can do to help you do that. I would love to hear you share that. All right, take care.